We're here at Trinity site for the 30th consecutive year. We arrived here in, in 1990 on July 16th. Small group of us, maybe about 30. No, eight, I think. It's eight then. Uh, and we arrived here to pray. Pray with Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the Mother of Jesus, the Mother of God. Pray with us to, to ask her to intercede with us uh, for protection from all that brought about this weapon, the atomic bomb, and from all the devastation it has brought to humanity since. And so on this 30th anniversary, let's try to refocus, if you will, as to the as to the precise reasons we are here and have been here for 30 years praying. You know, the Jewish theologian Martin Buber says that it is one of the great deceptions of evil that it gets people to believe that once they've chosen it, they can control it. This is self-evidently absurd to any of us who have lived a few adult years. You choose evil and the ripples go out in ways that are utterly and completely unexpected, go out to places we can't imagine, and across times that we have no control over. So that's exactly what the problem is here, starting on July 16, 1945, with the detonation of the atomic bomb. The bomb and its explosion were over in a matter of seconds. The consequences, the deadly consequences, destructive consequences, the consequences of pain and misery ripple out into humanity to this day. We can't see them, at least we don't want to see them. But they're there, and they're as real as real can be. Let me give you an example. In the, in the early 1950s, John Wayne and Susan Hayward made a movie called The Conqueror. It was about uh, Genghis Khan, and having gotten all the requisite permits and so forth, they made it in the desert, uh, just just a little bit north of St. George, Utah. And, and then the movie wasn't very good, but it made a lot of money because they were stars. John Wayne, Susan Hayworth, and 90 people who worked on that movie in St. George, Utah, got cancer. Now, St. George, Utah is 100 miles downwind from the Las Vegas nuclear testing site. By that time, dozens of nuclear weapons had been exploded there. The government verified that the land that they were taking the movie on, making the movie on, was free of radiation, was free of anything that could harm them. And yet 90 of the 200 people who worked on that movie died of cancer. That's what we're talking about. In our original mission statement, which is still our statement as to why we're here, there's a little paragraph that deals with the fact that one of the reasons we're here is because the explosion of the atomic bomb at Trinity site let loose on humanity a cauldron of diseases, physical, spiritual, and moral. A cauldron of diseases. That's beyond question. Think about what happened when the atomic bomb exploded. About a few minutes after it exploded, maybe a half hour, 
Robert Hoppenheimer and the people who were the scientists who made all this possible walked out to the place where the atomic bomb, the, the, the stand where the atomic bomb was. And of course that stand, along with everything else in the area, was evaporated. But when they looked to their right, what they saw was that the desert sand was no longer sand. It was glass. Green glass. The glass has a name today, it didn't then. It's called Trinitite. It's radioactive, radioactive to this day. What happened was that explosion of a nuclear weapon affected atomic, molecular, submolecular reality in ways that no one knows. And that is precisely why. Robert Oppenheimer, who knew more about how empirical reality is and exists than probably anyone else in the world, minus a few people, said it came to his mind the minute he saw the explosion. The words from the Bhagavad Gita, now I've become death, the destroyer of worlds. Indeed, he meant death in the sense of now there was a weapon in place that the politicians and the military could take and destroy other people in large, large numbers in other geographies and other places. But he also meant that he knew something happened on a level of existence that we are hardly aware of and we hardly know how it works. You don't look at sand turned into green glass and think there's nothing going on here that we don't know. And so it has happened. At first, it was thought that the, that the consequences of the bomb spread out 25 miles. Then within a short period of time, within a week, they said people were, should Evacuate, evacuate 50 miles. Now we know that the whole world is downwind from a nuclear explosion. Once, once it happens, the ripples go out to where we do not know and really to how we do not know. We know that they affect, we, they affect visible reality and invisible reality in ways that we know a little bit about, but not terribly much. Back in 1951, I believe it was, in Rensselaer, New York, there's a polytechnical college there, Rensselaer Polytech, and uh, it was just an average day, huh? and it started raining out. Rensselaer, New York. And Lo and behold, in this technical institute, the Geiger, cow Geiger counters that were working for other purposes went off the charts. This is all history, it's all there. And no one could figure out what was happening. What was happening was, days before, there was a nuclear test in Nevada, and this was the rain that was filled with the consequences of that test coming down 3,000 miles to the east in Rensselaer, New York. Registering off the charts. Uh, and what can you say? We know nothing. The fact of the matter is, huh, that way back, way back in 2,000 years ago. Our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ was very, very explicit. In a situation where violent self-defense was ever called for in defense of the innocent, they were attacking him in Gethsemane 
and going to take him to torture and death. And Peter pulled out his sword to defend him violently. And Jesus says to Peter, put up your sword. For the one who lives by the sword perishes by the sword. And on one personal level, that can be understood. Anytime I kill a human being, something, I kill something in myself. Something in me that was me is no longer there. Any policeman in any big city that kills a human being, even in the line of duty and legally and everything else in order with government regulations, any policeman who kills someone, they immediately confiscate his gun, they put him on paid leave, and they insist that he go to a psychologist or psychiatrist, and if he can't return mentally healthy, he gets full retirement. We know what happens to people inside, in them, when they kill someone else. Something in them is killed. Robert Michener, who wrote Tales of the South Pacific, from which the movie South Pacific came, he, he writes that in the Second World War, he was in the South Pacific. And he said, he went through all the regular military training and so forth and so on and thought nothing of it. But then one day he was in his trench on some island and a Japanese soldier came over the top of the trench and he was going to kill him. And not even thinking, he fired his gun and killed the Japanese soldier. He said without a split second difference, he vomited all over himself. He knew instantly something had happened that was irreversible in him. His words were, I simply destroyed something in myself that I knew was me, I knew was good, and I could never get back. So at that level there, Jesus is absolutely right. He who lives by the sword, dies by the sword, perishes. There is another level, because remember, Jesus came to save the world. Israel, yes, but he's very, very clear. The Father desires the salvation of all. And what that also means is, if you put your resources, your intelligence, your hard work, your time, your labor, your community, if you put all those resources into preparing and to killing people, you will perish by doing that. Resources that are put into, say, developing nuclear weapons are resources that are not put in to healing people of diseases, of all kinds of things of which they can be healed. So it's been said, even Pope Paul VI said himself, nuclear weapons kill even if they're never used. Of course they do. But when they are used, they send out ripples and streams of mutations and alterations of life that are lethal to humanity and to other plants and animals. And we, of course, have exploded we, the United States, has exploded over 2,000 of those weapons. Above ground, below ground, and at sea. What do we think that has done? We say, we don't see anything. We don't, and life is normal, it's just going on. But that's just the point. What nuclear weapons do, the destruction they wrought, there is an immediate side to it. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, those people are destroyed. And then, 
is a long, long, long time side to it. It goes on for generations. It takes so long that what is happening becomes normalized. People don't even realize it's happening. It's just taken for granted as time goes forward that this is normal. And so, and so it's like, it's like Jesus comes and he says to us, well, let's say he, let, let's say Jesus and I are standing, are standing on, on the tarmac of an airport. And we see this airplane over there, and it's got, it's a propeller plane. And there's four big propellers running, going crazy, you know, running around, going fast, and so forth and so on. And Jesus says to me, he says, he says, Charlie, don't go near those propellers. They're, uh, they're, they're really dangerous. They'll, they'll kill you if you get too close to them. And I, what do you mean? Just, what, what? Nothing's moving. It's just the propellers, uh, look, they're staying, staying still. He said, no, no, I'm telling you. Those propellers are going around tens of thousands of times a minute. You can't see it, but they're doing that. That's what's happening. No, I said like that. That's not, that's, that's not, no, that's not happening, Jesus. Look, I'll prove it to you. And I walk over and I reach out and I go to touch the propeller that seems to be standing still, and I'm torn apart. And then he tells someone else, and they touch it, and they don't believe him. Then someone else, and they touch it, and they don't believe it. And pretty soon, the whole tarmac is filled with decapitation and arms and legs and people dead and blood all over the place. And people still don't believe it. That when you choose against the will of God, you choose to kill your brother and sister. Something terrible happens, and the consequences go out that bring death, not to just yourself, but to others you can't even imagine in time and space. And so, and so we 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 come here, we come here every July 16 for 30 years to pray for protection from, from, from the consequences of this world. Not just, not just physical protection and protection from disease, not just for ourselves. But what we also need protection from is the diabolical spirit that produces them. Friends, war is not the same thing as two teenagers coming together in a street corner, having an argument and fighting. That is the eruption of immediate uh, violence on emotion. That's not what war is. It's presented that way just before it starts. But war is a long political, economic, sociological, manufacturing operation. Years and years in preparation before it's, it's ever declared. And so, in that process, at least since the 20th century began, the, some of the central figures, indeed, maybe the most important figures, indeed, maybe the figures that are the sine qua non, that which without which this destruction could not occur, Are the scientists. We are, we are not only in the middle of industrial war, we're in the middle of scientific war. Without the scientists, there's no atomic bomb, there's no mustard gas, there's no napalm, there's none of the stuff that we think as weapons of mass destruction. There are no weapons of destruction by viruses. There are no weapons of destruction by chemicals. There are no weapons of destruction by electromagnetic forces or by nuclear power. It's the scientist that has to make that available to the politician. And most of those scientists, not all, a huge percentage of those working day in and day out for very good salaries 
are Christians. Christians. And very proud of it. And so, and so when we when we look at this situation of Trinity site, we see not just an instrument of destruction. We look and we see the causes of that instrument being in existence. And yes, there are political causes, there are politicians, and yes, there's greed. And there's all kinds of that. But those weapons, none of these weapons come into existence unless the scientist is willing to take all that knowledge that he or she has, knowledge that's been accumulated for over 25,000 years, and it's brought to this, and instead of being brought to developing, protecting, healing, making human life better, an easier place for people to be good, it's brought to destruction for a good self. So the scientist really, in this day and age, is not particularly different from the man or the woman who is a prostitute. They're living life in a brothel. The person, in the pro the person who is the prostitute sells his or her body. The scientist sells his mind or her mind. They hand it over to the diabolical. It's very clear in the Gospels, to quote the famous biblical scholar John L. McKenzie, Violence lives in the reign of Satan. Or, to quote the Mass for Justice and Peace in the Roman Mitchell, Nit Missal in the Roman Catholic Church, the collect, the opening prayer, cruelty and violence have no place with God. This is all diabolical. This is all the satanic. But, we do not look at the deeper issues of the causes and we just look at the instrument. We can look at it if we wish, but then perhaps we're just nurtured in any particular culture not to see what we can see because if we saw it, it would greatly disturb us. And so on we go. Catholic universities, non-Catholic universities, not only producing the scientists and so forth to go out there and make these things, but actually allowing the companies to come in to recruit them to make these weapons of human destruction, whether they be atomic, high bacteriological, chemical, or electro -level. We will perish by the sword. And so, what we're, what we're here praying for is that the suffering stop, the misery stop, the scientists, the politicians, the military people, and those who mindlessly support the destruction of other human beings understand Destruction means human misery, not to one or two, to thousands and millions of people. You may cheer, cheer loudly, back in 1991, when live broadcast came in from Baghdad, when the first American sortie flew over and dropped on January 17, 1991, the opening bombs on Baghdad and went up in flames. And the, and, and the sports bars cheered as if we were watching a, a football game. Indeed, I was in Paris at the time and I listened to an interview of an American pilot flying who did one of those first runs in. And he said, I turned around, I turned around to come back over Baghdad. And he smiled and he said, it looked like a Christmas tree all lit up. 
if he wanted to see, because he could see. He was an intelligent, learned man. If he wanted to see the screams, the agony, the misery, the brokenness, the death was going on below in those flames, he could. But he just made the analogy to a Christmas tree and flew on back to the carrier to have a couple of beers with the boys. And the bomb exploded on July 16, 1945. Two plagues hit the world. The physical plague that was sent out over literally generations and is still going out of the destruction of human life by all kinds of mechanisms that we do not understand. The environment, disease, etc. It's still going on. The second plague that was released is the plague of the scientist. Those people with extraordinary minds have been given an extraordinary gift of God in terms of learning and being able to learn. Who take that gift and use it for the destruction of other people. Now, I don't know, because I am a Catholic, I don't know whether that's legitimate in terms of Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism. But what I do know is that it, that utterly contradicts the teaching of Jesus, everything he stood for, everything he was, and everything he says is the way to eternal life. Jesus teaches eternal life, the way to eternal life, is to respond to evil with love. Prayer is a form of love. Love is when you take your own life, freely take your own life, and use a piece of the time of your own life to serve another. So if I help a person across the street, it may only take two minutes. But that's two minutes of love that I put into the universe. It's that straight. If I say a prayer for someone, it may only take 15 seconds. But I'm using up my life's time to do something good for that person, to pray for them. And so we come to Trinity Site to bring good out of evil by entering into a loving act of prayer for humanity, for the science. For those who are prone to use violence and power to get more power. To pray for all the evil that was and surrounds the atomic blast on July 16, 1945. And to pray that God in his infinite mercy and wisdom would give us the grace to see the way around it, the way through it, the way to stop it. Not just for our sakes, but for the sake of all those people, men, women, and children, who are being destroyed to this hour by the consequence of what these scientists did and do, what this bomb and its sons and daughters do and did. Prayer. Prayer is only futile under one set of circumstances. If no one's listening. But as Christians, we say we believe Christ is risen. And when two or more are gathered in his name, he's with us, he's listening. And all power in heaven and earth is his. And so we pray with his mother, for whom he performed the first miracle, Cana. We pray that some grace, some miracle enter into this situation that brings humanity to see that they must and how it can reverse it and stop being an agent of evil and death. And so, let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon your world that it may see that 
violence is not your way. Violence is not the way of God. Violence is not the way of Jesus. Violence is not the way that humanity was made for. And to bring humanity to that peace that surpasses their present understanding. We ask this all in the unity of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Amen.